Between the 23rd and 26th of May 2019, I was a guest of the Austrian Wine Marketing Board at their Wine Summit program, which takes place every two years. What follows in this series is in-depth coverage of the journey along the Danube stream of the summit. This features a mixture of presentations from members of the Austrian Wine Marketing Board and a combination of presentations and tours of participating wineries. If you've ever wanted to increase your knowledge of Austrian wine, this is the place to be. And do be sure to subscribe to the podcast at interpretingwine.com slash listen so that you're alerted when new episodes go live. Today's episode of the Austrian Wine Summit series features Ludwig Holzer of Vincer Krems giving a Krem style masterclass. He kicks things off by giving us an overview of the region before guiding those of us present through a tasting of five flights from the region. This is certainly an episode where I'd recommend you downloading the Down the Danube program and following along with the wines. And even better if you can have one or two of these in your glass as you taste along. Enjoy! So Winzer Krems is a cooperative organization. We are based, as you see, in the Krems style. And we make a short introduction uh, to give you a little basics about our area. Um, then we will see a film. It will be about 12, 14 minutes. Uh, again, about a wine, a year in the vineyard. Uh, and then we will move on uh, just 200 meters from here to get to the tasting room. And then we will present you together with Arthur. Where's Arthur? Yep. Oh, my colleague. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we will present you wines from the northern bank uh, of the Danube. Uh, the Kremstal area is situated with the town of Krems and some villages in the north of the Danube, but also a small part of the area south of the Danube. Uh, what you see now is uh, two places of a winery tour. Uh, Winzer Krems is a cooperative organization. We have about 900 wine growers. Most of them are from the Kremstal region. A few of them are just from the surrounding uh, vineyards. 50% um, is Grüner Vetlina. And the place is really, I think, ideal uh, to give you a little introduction to the area. So you see all the catchment area is really dominated by, by rivers. The big one is for sure the Danube. So you see the Danube coming from the west, going to the east. You see a small part of the Wachau area. As far as I know, you'll go to Dürnstein later on. So this small village here is Dürnstein. Our cooperative colleagues domain Wachau here. This is a part of their vineyards. And the Kremstal starts with uh, a mountain which is called Pfaffenberg. So we will have some Riesling from the Pfaffenberg. This is here. It's this area. It's very steep terraces. It's about the same geological and also in terms of climate, very near to the Wachau. And as you go to the east, uh, you will have within a few kilometers, you have a very big difference of soil conditions. So what we will find out today is, for example, Wines from the Wachtberg, it's the middle part of Krems. The Sandgrube, this is the place where we are now, in the eastern part of Krems. And then we will have also wines from the neighbor village, which is Rohrendorf, from the Moosburgerin, and Arthur, was haben wir noch? Rohrendorf-Gedersdorf, Rohrendorf Gedersdorf. So the next two villages are belonging to the Kremstal as well. And north of us, we have a small village, not so small, but we have... Senftenberg, and we have uh, for sure, yeah, Senftenberg is the most important place, maybe, where Martin Niegel, one of also the famous producers, will have, will have wines from Martin Niegel as well, and from Breudel, both are in the Senftenberg area. It's again a very narrow valley. You see, there's also a river called Krems. So Krems is the name of the city, and Krems is also the name of this small river coming from the northwest and going into the Danube, and Krems Tal means the valley, valley of the river Krems. So Tal stands for valley. And so you see very small, narrow terraces along the river Krems and along the river Danube in the west. And going to the east, it, the valley opens up, and then it's very 
less terraces uh, and uh, yes, and slopes. So Krems style again along here, the town of Krems and the two villages east of Krems and two villages in the southern banks of the Danube. All the rest on the map is the Wachau here, the Kamptal. I'm not sure if you're going to the Kamptal as well with the big not the big, but the city of Langenlois. It's this big area here. And south of the Danube, you have also the Treisental, small part of the Treisental. Yeah. And all three areas have one together. The change, or the created, or the <coughs> joined to the DSC concept about 10 years ago. And all the three areas had the same idea to concentrate on Grüner Vitlina which is about 50% of the production here, and on Riesling, which is about 5 to 10% of the production. But it's very important in the mind of the producers. It's been always the special grape, the grape who needs most care in the vineyard and gives the best wines, so the king of the wines we always sing. Today we know Grüner Vitlina is equal to Riesling, even if we keep it in our winotech, in our wine museums for 30, 40, 50 years, we think it's as good as Riesling. And this is for sure a very positive thing as Grunewitlina is yeah, a synonym for Austria, for Austrian wine is our signature grape. We are very proud to make good Rieslings, but Riesling is Germany for many people, yeah, not so Austria. And so you see the grape varieties and you see soil profiles, which I think is also good to see. So we get some light on the soil profiles. It's the most important is Löss. It's in the Sandgrube. It's east of Krems. You see very mighty uh, uh, Löss uh, soil, which is sometimes 10, 15, 20 meters deep. It's very fertile. It keeps a lot of uh, humidity, which is very important. We have a lot of very dry years. Uh, so soil, uh, Löss soil can keep up to 20% of the volume uh, as can store humidity, water, which is very important. And uh, on the other side, very small distance, you have on the Pfaffenberg, we have a, we say, primary rock soil or soil over bed rock. And you see what's going on here. You have just a few centimeters where you can really dig on, work on. And then you have uh, just stone. Um, but you see what's going on. The roots of the vines are going really into the stone very deep. needs a lot of time. Uh, but then, if you see this, you can imagine the impression minerality in the wine <laughs> comes from there. Yeah? And it gives a very different style if it's Grüner Vetlina or Riesling. And we think Grüner Vetlina can be very different, but can go good on both options. We think the best Riesling are coming from primary rock salt, not really from less. Okay? Good. So as we have yeah, very tough timing, <laughs> we go down to our cellar and uh, see a film uh, about a year in the vineyard and you will see also some animals there. So the life in the vineyard, it's not only the wine growers, it's also some other friends there. Thank you. I hope you liked the introduction to the area. Now we go and uh, taste some wines. So uh, I just I just realized uh, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Ludwig. I'm Ludwig Holzer. I'm a general manager of Winzer Krems uh, for the cooperative. Uh, and at the same time, I'm also wine grower. As many COPE members, I have uh, one hectare vineyard. So this is my job for maybe two day afternoon. So usually Friday afternoon, Saturday, I really spend a lot of time in my vineyard. And it's so typical. Windsor Krems has uh, probably 60% of all our COPE members are people. They are retired or they have another profession and do the wine growing as a hobby. On the other side, we have also professional wine growers uh, living from, from the grape production. And they have maybe 20, 30, even 40 hectares sometimes. And... Uh, we have a first flight uh, with Grüner Vetlina. Uh, all of them are from the east of Krems, uh, so all of them are more or less based on Lös. And um, 
Uh, the first one is a Kremser Sandgrube. So it's the vineyards uh, in this area. Uh, they are not from Winzer Krems, they are from Weingut Eigner. Uh, Wolfgang Eigner is a very traditional wine estate uh, with based in the east of Krems, uh, near the vineyards. Uh, he has got about between 15 and 20 hectares, and uh, he has a very strong uh, concentration uh, in the vineyards in the Kremser Sand Group and in the eastern part of Krems. And his, uh, you will see his wines. I, I'm not re really the guy to talk a lot about the wines. I think you understand the wines. I'll try to give you a little of basic information. So first wine is Kremser Sandgrube from Wolfgang Eigner, a very typical Grüner Wittliner from, from Löss. And for the second wine, I'm very happy. We have uh, Franz Türk with us, the producer of the second wine of the Kremser Frechau. The wine number three is from Winzer Krems. Uh, it's a Kremser Wachtberg. Uh, I just realized again, the first wine, and this makes maybe a good difference, is the only vintage 2018. All the other three wines are vintage 17, and uh, probably, I guess, you already realized that there's a huge difference. Uh, 2018 was, difficult, but not, was not so easy for us. It's been extremely hot. We at Winzer Krems, we started the harvest already in end of August uh, with very high outside temperatures uh, and... Uh, it's been not really that easy. 2017 for us was uh, more classic Grüner Wettliner. We could uh, pick the grapes later, so we had a better chance to keep the acidity and to keep a good balance in the wine. So the 2, 3, and 4 are all 17, and the Kremser Wachtberg Grüner Wettliner is already a Kremstel DSC Reserve. So the wine has got about 14, 14.5 alcohol, uh, and it's a little different also from style because the Krems of Achberg is uh, a little bit the centerpiece of the town of Krems. Maybe you remember on the map, uh, it's half the way between the Löss of the Sandgrube and the mountains of the Pfaffenberg. And so on the Wachberg you have underneath, you have uh, Roxo uh, with about maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 centimeters Löss on top. So the Wachberg is a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, a mixture or, or, yeah, the thing between the Lus and between the, between the rock soul, and this gives a different style, uh, I would say. And for wine number four, I would ask uh, Arthur, because he's more or less the neighbor of the uh, Hermann Moser winery. Welcome well, from me as well. I hope that you all had a good night's rest after the exhausting day yesterday. Um, for the wine, it's uh, from one of my dear friends, uh, Martin Moser. His winery is called Weingut uh, Hermann Moser, located on the eastern part of the Kremstar. Yesterday we talked a little bit about uh, the eastern part of the Kremstar. Uh, we have predominated all those two villages that are considered the eastern part of the Kremstar are called Gedersdorf and Lohrendorf. Um, and predominantly we have less soil uh, on those two villages. Uh, they give me a little bit, a little bit the, the exemption uh, because it has conglomerate soil beneath. We have only approximately a meter, maybe two meters of less soil, and underneath hmm? that we have uh, uh, conglomerate rocks, which gives uh, the wines uh, most of the time it's raising or burning the greener, growing the giggling. Um, gives a, a hint of minerality. It's a very, very hot um, uh, crew. Um, it, uh, it faces southwards and gets sun from the early morning till the late uh, afternoon, or even until uh, the evening. So uh, it, it always gets this wine to have a little bit less uh, acidity and are a little bit more on the palate, I would say. Um, fun fact about this one, it's called Hannah. Um, it's named after his, uh, after his older daughter. And this is a uh, Jordi Oak, as far as uh, So the whole idea of this slide was now to give you an overview from uh, the wine from the eastern part, the wine from the northern part, and the wine uh, from, the, from the western part. And one from the center part, basically. From mm -hmm. the center. Yeah, the reserve, uh, when we started, uh, there's a little bit changing going on at uh, this moment about uh, the, the regulations of the Kremstel DSC. But uh, the start was uh, Kremstel DSC is 
a maximum alcohol of 13. And everything what is 13 plus uh, is a reserve. Uh, and the standard DSC was uh, to be described as fruity, uh, peppy, spicy, typical Grenovate Lina taste. Uh, for the reserve, it's always been allowed to play around a little bit. I would say uh, some of my co of the colleagues are working with Potritis uh, to produce a different, uh, powerful style. Other ones are, uh, are working probably maybe also with Barrique, which is very uh, unusual for Grüner Vetlina. But for the reserve category, it's basically allowed. Yeah? For the basic Kremstel DSC, it would be not allowed. Yeah? Uh, the idea is to give uh, the, um, the public, the consumers, an idea about the classic uh, Kremstel DSC style. And for the reserve it needs to be 13 alcohol, but otherwise it's uh, allowed to play around a little bit with the philosophy. Yeah, it's, it's again from, from, from different areas, yeah? Uh, so it's not really, it's been not the idea to give special areas at the one flight and other areas on the second flight. So as you see, we go, we started with uh, 2018 with one just younger Novitlina. Then we had in the first flight three uh, wines with 2017. In the second flight, we have another two. Um, I think both are probably reserve categories. Huh? Hans, yes. The, the, uh, yes. So it's 2017. And then you have two more wines which are a little bit older. Uh, one 16 and one more of a 2006 Grüner Vitlina. So the... We did it a little bit with the vintages and not necessarily with the different styles of the origins. All wines are dry by the law. You mean number four of, of first flight? Yeah, yeah. You see, it's, yeah, it's a little bit higher in residual. Uh, the old traditional idea was to have dry wines with a maximum of 4 gram residual, but this changed when Austria joined the European community. So when we have been taking over the wine regulations of the European community many years ago, uh, we opened up and so it's allowed to have uh, a residual sugar also with more than 4 gram and to call it dry. So the regulation is maximum of 8 or acidity plus two. So if you have five gram acidity, uh, you have a maximum residual of seven uh, to be called a dry wine. Yeah, uh, this is what you read on the label. The other thing is what you feel on your palate. Yeah, it's not always hundred percent the same. Same. Grunewaldlina from Lus in general have a very usually a very mighty in terms of extract. So I remember also 20, 30 years ago when we brought our wines first to London Wine Trade, for example, everyone said the wines are sweet. And I said, no, they have just two gram residual. But the feeling on the palate for a Grüner Vitlina, for a soft Grüner Vitlina of a good vintage produced on less was always a soft feeling on the palate. Yeah? We can imagine, you think it's more residual than it's finally there. So the first wine of the second flight is again from Weingut from Wolfgang Eigner, the same producer as the first wine of the first flight, but now it's also a vintage 2017, and it's uh, a reserve style. And this is, I think, what you uh, check when you when you uh, yeah when you taste the wine. It's uh, it's for me it's really the best picture maybe of a very powerful Grunewetliner from Lös. It's this very typical style Grunewetliner Kronan Lös and the Frechau is, uh, as Franz said before, it's quasi the neighbor vineyard of the Sandgrube uh, with very same style or, or yeah, basics in terms of uh, Lös as a soul and also um, the microclimate is more or less the same. It's, it gets warmer um, climate is changing and 2017 was uh, a powerful vintage uh, but for I think um, late enough for uh, a perfect base for me to have also a good balance between this very powerful style and at least the acidity which uh, keeps the wine very yeah, alive I would say 
but I think we can a little bit see the difference between number one and number two, between the really very hot place of a Sandgrube and Frechau, and a little bit cooler style, a little bit slimmer style of the Kremstal Valley uh, with Senftenberg. Number four is again the Kremser Wachtberg. Uh, you had already the vintage 2017 in the first flight uh, from Winzer Krems. And this was the idea to give, you a, to give you an idea, to give you an impression what's going on if Grunewetlina is aging. Uh, and we are one of a uh, few, or in the meantime, maybe more uh, producers who keep the wines for a very long time. So we have... Some wines in our, we say Winotech, or you can say Wine Museum, um, we passed by um, before we've seen the film. And there we have wines uh, which are up to 60 years old. So the eldest Vitlina we have is a, a 1946. Uh, we opened a few bottles uh, two years ago for the Wachauf Gourmet Festival. We do not have so many of them, but we have some good stock of, uh, of the 70s at least. And... Uh, it's a different style, yeah, because in these years we had most of these wines have been in, in oak barrels, and um, it makes a change uh, going to stainless steel, and we will have another change now maybe going to, uh, to cap screw closures, yeah, because until 2013 uh, we had our reserve wines with cork, and now we have it with screw cap. Uh, but you see what's going on. Yeah? It, it keeps fresh. It, it needs time to breathe. Yeah? So I was not really 100% lucky with my first uh, put the nose in the glass. But if you give a little bit of time in a few minutes, uh, it opens up. It needs time. And when we open wines, which are there for 13, 30 or 40 years, then we open it really at least one day before we present it. Yeah? And uh, they're getting better and better and better. Yeah? It's a little bit strange because you could imagine that with some oxygen that the wines are gone, but the, the difference happens, yeah? especially all our white wines, uh, or not all, but 90% of the white wines are getting better and better and better uh, if they have time to, to breathe. And uh, this is up to three, four days usually. And uh, yeah, no, it's it's vinified as as we do it now. It's uh, stainless steel. Uh, it's been really already at that time pressing of whole bunches. So we do not we do not uh, keep it on the on the on the skins. Yeah, uh, it's really. Uh, we started two years ago to start with machine picking. Yeah, definitely not in the premium vineyards. Yeah, but at that time it's been always hundred percent hand picking. Uh, we wanted to have on a very on a very short and fast way into our press house, and then we bring it as whole bunches uh, to our uh, press, and we do not lose time usually. Maybe for this, okay, the premium Pfaffenberg, uh, we, we empty or we, we harvest in this really small pins yeah, with about 20 kilogram, so you can sort it out if it's not perfect, but usually this is the job of our wine grower, so for the premium wines like the Wachtberg, we make a special additional contract with the member so they have to follow our rules and uh, we tell them a little bit what to do in the vineyard during the year. Uh, but from the vinification, it's uh, press, stainless steel. We, we, also the fermentation, we, are not, we do not have the philosophy at Winzer Krems to, to keep the fermentation going on for many weeks. Yeah, if it's done in 10 days, then we'll have a dry wine. Then we keep it on the fine lease for many months if it's fine. Yeah, that's, that's good, yeah, but not, not fermentation can be go through. And the number three in this flight is uh, also a, a single vineyard, a crew. Uh, uh, Riesling for sure from Ried Grillenparts. This is, uh, it's not too far from the Pfaffenberg and uh, not a big difference, I would say, in style or in soil conditions. So it's in one of the most western uh, areas of the town of Krems, just when you arrive from the Wachau. And it's produced from uh, Stadt Domain, Stadt Krems, or wine estate uh, Stadt Krems. So um, the, the town of Krems has its own winery or its own yeah, wine estate. Uh, called the Mainstadt Krems and uh, Fritz Miesbauer, maybe you've heard or met him, uh, a dear friend of us is the channel manager there and they have about 30, 35 hectare uh, of vineyards uh, in the town of Krems and uh, he cares also for the Weingutstift Göttweg uh, together with his uh, friend. Uh, but this one is from the 
um, curriculum paths, um, and I think you see the difference uh, going there. It's more austere, maybe, or more, more, yeah, coming from typical uh, primary rock soul from from west of Krems. It's not not too far from a Wachau style, probably. In the second class, uh, you have um, oh, Riesling for sure. It's a, a Steiner Kögel, again a Cru single vineyard. Uh, and this, I think, for the first time from uh, Weingut uh, Salomon. Um, I guess some of you could know Bertolt Salomon, who is, who has been general manager of the Wine Marketing Board many years ago, uh, spent a long life in the uh, tradition uh, of wine production is probably one of the oldest mentioned uh, name well known for for um, in already 30 years ago as a wine estate in Krems and uh, the Undhof uh, is uh, yeah maybe most of the western wine estates of Krems uh, in the not in the in the historic center but between, between Stein and Krems and the vineyard Steiner Kögel uh, is also most, one of the most western uh, places. Uh, you have the Grillenbads. Um, you will have a Pfaffenberg, which is the most western area uh, or vineyard in Krems. But then is the Kögel uh, also west and uh, more. Of, this is more the cool climate now, I would say, of all the Krems regions. It's a very typical style of Kögel. And the wine number three and number four is uh, Kremser Pfaffenberg. It's probably one of the best known uh, Riesling vineyards in the Kremstal area. It's as I told you on, when we've been on this map, on the picture uh, before, it's the first vineyard when you arrive from Wachau. It's the most uh, western vineyard in Krems. It's a very steep uh, terraced uh, primary rock soil vineyard. And uh, you have a 2013, which is uh, already some, some development, as you can see. Uh, and for me personally, 2013 was one of the best uh, vintages, at, especially for Grüner Wittlina, to say, but also for Riesling. It's been this perfect mixture. We had the chance to pick very late with a good ripeness, but it's been not as hot. We picked most of the grapes in, in October and even early November, and uh, this is for us a perfect, uh, especially also for Riesling, where you want to have this uh, cooler style of, of fruit. And uh, 2012 has been one of the hot vintages already, uh, and uh, so this makes a difference, uh, I think, in style, yeah. So I do not have the 2012 in my class, but uh, it should be... Yeah, the wo it's, the, it's the warmer vintage. When it comes to, to age wines, we always thought that uh, acidity is very, very, very important. Uh, when I see our wines, uh, we have um, Grüner Vitlina, very soft style of the uh, some of the 70s and... Uh, we have, for example, Neuburger as a speciality of Austria, which has very low acidity levels. And we have a very beautiful Neuburger of, uh, I think, 61, uh, so 40, almost 50, you know, 50 years old in the meantime. And uh, so it's not, it's not the acidity is, is one factor, but not everything, definitely. Thank you so much, Ludwig, and to all at Vincer Krems. I'd certainly recommend you downloading the full Down the Danube program and looking at the wines that we tasted. And as this is the halfway point of the Austrian Wine Summit series, I'd certainly recommend that you subscribe to the podcast at interpretingwine.com slash listen. Our next stop on the Austrian Wine Summit series in episode 361 is Domaine Vacau. See you then.